I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long, How not long, long. How long? through forever on the scaffold, wrong yes, forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, How long? Not, not, long. not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, He's trampling out the village oh, where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Back on the Young Turks, Michael Shore with Richard Escow. Jank is back tomorrow. J.R. Jackson, Jesus Godoy, and Anna Kasparian helping us. Tom Hank is here. And uh, Richard, uh, it, always great to listen uh, to Julian Bond. His voice is uh, extraordinary. A thing of beauty, absolutely. Uh, you also never run out of questions to ask him. Uh, it's, uh, it's um, you know, his the fact that he was, I mean, he was in the only class that Martin Luther King ever taught makes you want to just, you know, chat him up all night. Uh, but, you know, I thought some of the, some of what's interesting about the civil rights issue is, is and I touched on it with him, and, and you're aware of the, this, is the, the, the black presence in the gay marriage issue. Mm -hmm. And um, you would expect as a, you know, just as a lay person to think, well, obviously they would be in favor of uh, anything having to do with civil rights. Uh, it is quite the opposite. The civil rights movement, the one that you know, Dr. King, who was a minister himself, over oversaw, um, was it all started in the churches, and uh, we forget that it was a movement that started in religious places and branched out across Absolutely. the, the I th south. I think that's a very important point. Uh, the civil rights movement was, in many ways, a religious movement, and uh, religious movements can be very traditional. So you have a conflict of forces at work here when you think of some of the traditional uh, church, really in, in the South as I understand it, churches were one of the very few places historically that African Americans could congregate yeah. uh, openly. So they became the center for this kind of social change but still preaching a traditional religious message and you find now for example with the Episcopalian Church being uh, split by all sorts of controversies around the issue of gay marriage, the recognition of a gay archbishop, that the African churches uh, are among the most conservative in the Anglican and Episcopalian movement and the most resistant to that form of change. So you do have this yeah. disparity between one form of civil rights and another. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, there's a th it's a thematic, uh, a, a thematic part of, of all the civil rights, uh, of the entire civil rights movement was the fact that it, it took place in churches. And it was one of the, when, when the line was crossed and they bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, that was the first invasion into the churches in that in such a violent and, and way. I mean, the, the, there were protests around churches and near churches, and they tried to block people from getting to churches. But it wasn't like it wasn't the, the violence. That was the first time it permeated the churches themselves. But but you know what we're saying is that that it's interesting how much religion is a part of that, and that uh, somehow people find that two you know men or two women marrying one another. Is is a religious issue rather than a civil, you know, a civil issue is uh, is interesting to say the least. And the last comment on that, I think it's also one of the reasons why so much civil rights rhetoric is so beautiful. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Yeah. I always get a uh, thrill when I hear that line. But that African American preaching tradition yeah. was so eloquent and so beautiful, such a great form of self-expression that I think it's really infused. No, I, I, it's, a very, it's a really good point. It's, it's what has, I think, been contributed towards its uh, perpetuation. That we can, you know, I said at the top of the show, listening to the I Have a Dream speech, you'd think you'd be as bored of listening to that as you would the national anthem if you were a sports fan. I mean, it's, it's so played, it's so hurt. Each time, though, it moves you in some Absolutely. kind of way. Whether I mean, And it didn't speak to me. You know, my, I've lived a charm 
charmed life with every civil right I needed. But it's, um, it's and we should talk about that. We're two white guys sitting here in a studio uh, and talking about civil rights. But I do think that um, one day everybody will be dead who is involved in the civil rights movement. Absolutely. And it's incumbent upon everybody, whatever you look like or sound like, uh, to continue talking about it and to continue remembering why we celebrate this day. Uh, it will be in 150 years a strange day on a lot of people's calendars. But for the moment, we have to keep talking about it um, because it will. Um, it is a part of our immediate past, like nothing else, certainly in this country. Absolutely. With that, we, and we will allow Martin Luther King Day to inform every bit of this show today, but with that, we, we should talk a little bit about, about politics, a little bit about um, a civil right, as if we can stretch it, which is health care and how, that will, how the politics, uh, electoral politics in the country will be affected, um, will be affecting uh, legislation. Uh, tomorrow in Massachusetts, there is a Senate race that many of you have heard about to fill the seat of uh, late Senator Edward Kennedy. Uh, Martha Coakley, the Attorney General of Massachusetts, will, is running against Scott Brown, who's a state senator. It seemed like a race that, you know, the Democrats just sort of closed their eyes and thought that they would win. They got used to having that Senate seat since they've had it for 50 some odd, 60, 70, 80 years. I don't even know who the last Republican to hold that seat was. Uh, well, it turns out that Scott Brown has narrowed that race a little bit. We're going to have a guest on here, um, you know, in the in the next segment, uh, talking about that a little bit. But let, RJ, you know, as someone who is familiar with uh, with the healthcare debate, um, let's talk first before we talk about the politics of which we'll save for our guest from the Boston Globe. What what is the effect on healthcare? What what does this mean? There are lots of different permutations uh, of a a win by Coakley or a loss by Coakley, and what that means. Well, you know, there are two schools of thought ab about that. One is that a loss by Coakley would mean the end of uh, any chances for health reform passing because she would be that 60th vote that we're told the Democrats need in order to pass effective health reform. Well, but, but I want to I want to argue with you on that one. Uh, I'm not. You're, yes, oh, you're not done I'm, yet. Okay, I'm, I'll let and, you. Fin I'll let you finish before. And I I'm not necessarily <laughs> endorsing that. Position. No, no, I'm I'm just saying that I don't even know that that is. I don't think that the the a 59 se vote Senate is the death knell for health care reform at all. I, think, I don't yeah, either. Okay. But that's one school of thought. Yeah. So that school of thought goes that if Martha Coakley loses, then health reform is over. Uh, now we have other people saying, well, if Coakley loses, the Democrats will move to reconciliation and perhaps rule changing in order to enact health reform despite the lack of 60 votes. And there's another school of thought that says we can get better health reform if, in fact, they do that. Yeah. And if it requires her losing this election in order to push them into that position, the net result might be one less Democratic seat and much better health reform than the watered-down version we're seeing today. Yeah. I, um and they all make sense, and there are two schools. And then there's uh, then there's the the sort of the school for truants like me, who I, I you know there's a part of me that only wants health care reform if there's a public op option that wants to vote against any other kind of health care reform because I think this is the window of it happening, certainly in the next you know five to fifteen years. That being said, uh, it's hard for me to root against a Democrat losing because right. there are other uh, more important, I mean, not more important, there are other important issues. Uh, there are the issues of justices uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, to the Court of Appeals. I think that when you lose that power of filibuster, and granted, we may only have it for another year as Democrats because the, I'm certain that the Democrats are going to lose three, four, maybe five, six seats in the Senate next year. So this is a window of having that filibuster-proof majority. Uh, where I disagree with one school is that, you know, if Coakley were to lose tomorrow, and let, let me be on the record of saying I don't think there's a chance she's going to lose. I think, I think that Coakley's going to win tomorrow, and I think we're just, but this is politics. I thought the, uh, I thought the Chargers were going to win yesterday. Um, I, I, I think, though, that what will happen is the White House is going to go to the House of Representatives if, if she loses and say, listen, we need to get the Senate bill. We need you to approve that Senate bill on the floor, and we need to bring it to the Senate. We need to pass it. I need to sign it. Because I think there's a part of it that the, the, that's the White House, the bill the White House kind of prefers anyway, politically, um, is what I think. Um, that's just me. Uh, but I, I also think that there's a practical matter of it. it right now, it's, it's going to have to go to reconciliation. They're going to be fighting over it, even if, if, if Brown loses and Coakley wins. It's, there's, we all know that it's not a done deal. Uh, but I do like opening the door to the possibility of a public option the next time this comes up. 
let me tie Dr. King back into the conversation. Go Since ahead. you mentioned the public option, I wrote about health reform in the context of uh, Martin Luther King Day today. And you can see that on HuffingtonPost.com. It's on, uh, thank you, it, it is indeed. Dr. King, I said, well, of course we can't know what Dr. King would think about the public option. The right. whole notion was unknown 40 years ago. But he did say, quote, traditional capitalism has created conditions permitting necessities to be taken from the many to give luxuries to the few and has encouraged small-hearted men to become cold and conscienceless. The profit motive, when it is the sole basis for an economic system, encourages cutthroat competition and selfish ambition. So, uh, needless to say, having used that quote, you could guess that I'm also a public option yeah. supporter. I, uh, and I think the other uh, lesson, if we want to pivot a little bit and talk about the politics now, the other lesson from Massachusetts, I tend to believe that Coakley will win also, and that part of this is, uh, is a kind of fear campaign uh, designed to motivate uh, Democrats to turn out tomorrow and increase uh, their, their voting numbers. But it was also a response to some poll numbers, whether they were you know, egregious or not. They were poll numbers. Yes, you know, and they, she did lose a significant lead. The race become, became much tighter. And the reason it became much tighter was because of health reform. Yeah. So I think there is a warning message for the Democrats, which they're unfortunately likely to ignore if she wins tomorrow. Yeah. I think that, that will be the takeaway. If she loses, the takeaway may be we need to reconsider the political impact of the way we've designed this health reform process. We need to now consider whether the absence of a public option, the presence of costly mandates without giving people a lower cost alternative might not seriously hurt us in the polls. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that that, I mean, that sort of takes all of the politics at hand, and that, and that makes perfect sense. I, I also think that the Democrats um, are are realizing the sort of the true nature of what the political, you know, spectrum looks like going going forward. I do think that unlike, and, and I said this on the show on Friday, unlike the races that we just had, the special election or the regular ele elections in November for the governor of New Jersey and the governor of Virginia where two Democrats lost there. I never thought that those were bellwethers for anything. I do think if Scott Brown wins tomorrow, it is a bellwether. I do think that it is people, uh, it, it, it is about people who are opposed to the health care reform that's on the table, that are opposed to the way the Obama administration has been waffling on, on, on how they uh, uh, want to approach the health care debate. And I, I think that uh, it, it, it means a lot more to the Democrats than did those elections in, in uh, the fall. And think about this, Michael. There's only one state in the country that has experienced Obama-style health reform, mandates and no public option, and that's Massachusetts. Right, thanks to Governor Mitt Romney. <laughs> exactly, so it's a, a tangled web we weave. Uh, we will be back and, and able to talk about this with somebody who is, uh, who is there in uh, Massachusetts and who has his finger on the pulse of what's going on in this election. David Beer from Boston Globe and Boston.com will be uh, joining us after the break. Happy Martin Luther King Day to everyone. Come back, uh, you're on The Young Turks. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is a word maladjusted. It is a ringing cry of modern child psychology, maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But as I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, that there are some things in our society and some things in our world for which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. Welcome to the Young Turks. It's our Martin Luther King Day uh, show. Michael Shore here. Jenk is back tomorrow. Richard Eskow is with me. And uh, special thanks to uh, J.R. Jackson for putting together 
and finding some of the lesser known words of Martin Luther King um, for us to, uh, to listen to today. It was hard work finding them and uh, also getting Paul Anka's band to play behind them. That was pretty nice also. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to do a radio show now we've, uh, and not talk uh, incessantly about what's going on in Haiti. Uh, there was a, um, and I think this is, you know, somewhat appropriate. We might be pushing it uh, with the Martin Luther King Day. But yesterday, uh, presidents, uh, former President Bush and former President Clinton were together uh, on all of the news show. they were, shows they were seated at the White House and taking interviews from all the news shows because they are putting together the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund dot uh, org and they are you know have big plans for what they're going to do with that money. President Clinton uh, has been uh, really involved in Haiti for a very long, long time, uh, and now he's the special envoy of the United Nations there. So for him, it's an appropriate mission. But you know, it's a mission about coming together, people who. You know, I, you know how I feel about uh, George W. Bush, um, but I couldn't help yesterday but kind of root for him when, for the first time ever, when I saw him sitting next to Bill Clinton talking about what was going on in Haiti. Well, I'll tell you, he's if he can raise money for people who need it, I'm all for it. Yeah, uh, and and you know he certainly can. He's raised uh, money for you know people who don't need it. So uh, that's he, he should, true. But but uh, without but thinking, Terry Bradshaw went on after he did it that big. Uh, event he appeared at, the inspirational salesmanship event. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's not a bigger draw than Terry Bradshaw. So if we can get Clinton Bush and Terry Bradshaw. Right. Well, I mean, he, he's a lot of things, George W. Bush. An inspirational speaker, in fact, I would bet that he would not even call himself. Uh, but it, it, without uh, being cynical, it was pretty impressive. And, and let's, uh, let's listen to a little bit of what uh, the former president and uh, the former presidents uh, had to say. Uh, this is uh, George W. Bush. Uh, the uh, 43rd President of the United States. Uh, this is clip number three, JR. President Bush, what did you learn in your government's response to the tsunami, to the disaster response to Katrina? What lessons did you learn that this administration should bear in mind? Uh, first of all, it takes time to get the supplies in place. But that, that, that shouldn't deter them. In other words, there, there's an expectation uh, amongst people that things are going to happen quickly. And, and sometimes it's hard to make things happen quickly. Secondly, there is a great reservoir of goodwill that uh, wants to help, and th that's why he asked us to help, and we're glad to do it. Uh, I need to put a pitch in for the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund org. One of my concerns uh, around any crisis is that shysters show up and take advantage of people's goodwill and generosity, and so therefore, if people want to help, one one avenue besides the established. NGOs would be to would be to tap onto that website and and we'll we'll help make sure your money is spent in a transparent accountable way. In some circles, the president's been criticized for politicizing this disaster. Do you think that's fair? Uh, I, I don't know what what they're talking about. I, I I've, I've been briefed by the president about the response, and as I said in my opening comment, I, I appreciate the president's quick response to this disaster. You know, if I can just for a second take back a little bit of my cattiness about President Bush a, mo a moment ago, I will say this, that he's showing a kind of political courage that uh, Bill Clinton and some of the other respondents don't have to have because he's the only one stepping up to the plate and raising money for Haiti who has to contend with people in his own movement who oppose that idea. Yeah. No sane person as an independent or a Democrat would oppose raising uh, funds for this, these people who need it so desperately. But President Bush is actually showing some political courage by resisting those conservative voices that say we shouldn't give a nickel. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, we all know that uh, that uh, George W. Bush is a man of faith, and I think that this is one of those times where the faith calls and and the man responds. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I think that it's Im impossible to argue that we could sit here and do shows as we did for eight years about um, about what we don't like about George W. Bush. But the fact is that you know he's come together. He's uh, he has, and you knew also, I think, that he, and he had to have known that in, in stepping up to an endeavor such as this, that uh, he would have to answer a lot of questions about Katrina 
And um, this shouldn't be about Katrina. We all know what happened with Katrina. This should be about learning what, what shouldn't be done the next time and not sort of blaze, you know, not saying, uh, but President Bush, you blew it on Katrina. Why should you be in charge of Haiti? He's not in charge of rebuilding Haiti. He's in charge of raising money to help rebuild Haiti and to help fix Haiti and to have somebody who is, you know, uh, has some influence within his own political constituency is pretty great. And I know, listen, there are people who listen to the show who never want to hear a good thing about George W. Bush. Um, and you're still safe listening here, but uh, this is a pretty impressive uh, endeavor that's, that's gone on. And I, I think a lot of it, the credit, too, goes to Bill Clinton, who has kind of endeared himself to that family after running against President Bush the Elder in 1992. Um, he, he struck up a good relationship with President, you know, President Bush 41 uh, in, during, in the tsunami relief uh, effort. And I, I think that that's passed down. I, I heard President Bush say that uh, Barbara Bush calls him the stepbrother or something, the, uh, the evil stepbrother, maybe, but just the stepbrother. Uh, mm -hmm. on, that, on that, though, let's listen to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton has spent a tremendous amount of time since the mid to early 70s in Haiti. Um, and uh, he knows the region pretty well. Uh, and uh, let's listen. Uh, JR, this is clip number, uh, clip number four. President Clinton, look at our experience. Almost a trillion dollars in trying to rebuild Iraq and Afghanistan, the money that's been poured in uh, to Haiti. Why does Haiti matter strategically? Because, number one, it has the highest AIDS rate in the Caribbean. And our neighbors, we don't want them spending money on crushing health burdens that they can avoid. Number two, it's the poorest country in the Caribbean, and it's holding the whole region back. And the Caribbean and Central America and Latin America, they all want to help now. For the first time in my lifetime, they are committed to being good partners with Haiti. And number three, uh, they actually have shown a willingness to change, to, to, to improve their own circumstances. And therefore, if they could succeed where they have failed for 200 years, that would change our idea of what is possible, not just here, but in Africa and East Asia and everywhere else. They're not in, this government has not made excuses. They said, we know we've made mistakes in the past. We want to make changes. I have seen them make several changes just since I've been working. Uh, that's worth it all over the world. So, I mean, needless to say, a lot, a lot of Americans, um, and one of them, Rush Limbaugh, are saying that we already give enough money to Haiti. We already look after Haiti with our tax dollars. Uh, say what you will about that, but it's a totally irresponsible thing for anybody to be saying, especially somebody like Rush Limbaugh, uh, because of the number of people that listen to him. It's not about, uh, about the fact that we already give tax dollars. There are people dying, and the numbers today became more sobering than even thought earlier. Right now, they're estimating, and these are really new numbers, over 200,000 people dead oh and one and a half million people homeless. Um, and uh, this isn't about uh, our U.S. taxes going to Haiti. This is about a, a worldwide emergency in a place that is uh, our neighbor. And as President Clinton said, it's the, the, the uh, you know, the, the worst, uh, the poorest country in, in our hemisphere and the one with the highest AIDS rate. Um, something has to be done. These are people. And, uh, you know, there's a conservative mythology, too, that says that uh, we give much more in foreign aid out of our tax dollar than we actually do. That's very true, yeah. We are not a generous aid country particularly, and these are people very close to us. This is a culture and a country in our hemisphere. This is a, a country we have many uh, immigrants who from Haiti who are American citizens and part of our nation. These are human beings, yeah. fellow human beings, suffering and dying close to our shores and the notion that any human being, and I use the term loosely, could suggest that it's, it makes sense to ignore someone in desperate need and yet still call themselves a Christian right. just appalls and horrifies and, needless to say, disappoints me. No, no, it, it, it is. It's, you know, if we're this, and this is hypothetical, were this happening in Ireland, I don't think the reaction would be the same. Uh, but it's not, and, and that's also probably not fair for me to say because I don't know that that's not the case. But, you know, a lot of people uh, do subscribe to that mythology, this conservative mythology about, you know, I, our giving is generous because it's a lot of money, but it's a mile wide and an inch thick in a lot of places. And we, we have to give a lot of foreign aid to a lot of countries all over the world. 
Uh, it's what happens when you are the leading democratic nation in the world, and this is part of leading, is helping. And I, I think that, uh, that anybody who is saying anything that's opposite, when you hear 200,000 people on an island that is a couple hundred miles from, three, I don't know, maybe a, a thousand miles from our shores, um, I think that that's when you have to say, wait a second, you know, this is more than that. Uh, and it is, and it's nice to see two presidents stepping up. Again, it's ClintonBushHaitiFund.org. I even heard somebody com complaining that it wasn't BushClintonHaitiFund.org, <laughs> which is just beautiful. Uh, uh, we, will we will be talking more about Haiti later in the hour. We have someone who was in Haiti uh, uh, during the earthquake who's going to join us on the show um, at, a, at a sort of uh, at probably 20 up. But I, 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 do, uh, I do urge you to listen to her. Her story is incredible. And uh, to you know to have someone on the air with us who who was there experiencing it is pretty great. Uh, we will come back uh, also and speak uh, on this Martin Luther King Day with someone who has a different take on Dr. King because you can always hear all the takes here on the Young Turks. I'm Michael Shore. This is Richard Escow. You're listening to the Young Turks. Welcome back to the Young Turks. This is Anna Kasparian and J.R. Jackson with you. Jake will be back for tomorrow's show, but we got to play the song a little longer. This, this is by this is by request from Casper. This is my all-time favorite song. It always puts me in a good mood. This one really? Ah, push it. <laughs> I can't do this when Jenk is here. Jenk wants this, the song to be over as fast as possible so he can talk. Unless I like to enjoy the music a little unless bit. Unless it's something like Taco or um, Another Night in Bangkok, shit like that. Yeah, that he'll let it play for a little while. <laughs> Salt and Pepper's here. <laughs> That's because Jake was old by the time this came out. <laughs> That's he true. was already in law school, probably. What are these whippersnappers listening to? Who is salted pepper? Pepper? Right. <laughs> pepper. Is this two pack? <laughs> All right. Oh, these young kids and their hip hop, <laughs> as Ben would say. Okay, so uh, I understand that. No, oh, so yeah, uh, off of your request, we were just talking about um, mm -hmm. Peppa. Mm -hmm. Peppa. Pepper. Um, anyway, she has a new reality show uh, as because, you know, I peruse VH1 for the reality shows all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't watch this one, though, because I just really don't care. Because there was a previous one they had when it was both of them. Mm -hmm. They followed both of them, which I didn't watch either. But I was listening um, on my XM satellite radio, driving home. Mm -hmm. And they were talking to her the night of the premiere of the show. And she was talking about how she doesn't, you know, she had issues with guys. And that's half of the storyline that it follows her in her life with that and the issues and struggles with dudes. And she said she's been celibate for four years. Yes, and there was the, the, the show was two other women were there, and then there was some guy who randomly jumps in every once in a while. But so it got on the subject of celibacy and how long women can go and how cleansing it is for some. One of them was really like, she was like, oh, yeah, I've been doing it too. And she was like, like you know, militant about it. She's like, you know, you know, when you let someone in your realm like that, you have to make sure that they're this and that because if they have negative energy, they're infusing negative energy in you. I was like, damn, fuck they're, you they're been messing injecting with. Negative yeah, energy. Yeah, I was like, it was it was very, <laughs> it was very explicit without it being explicit. But um it caused me to think and I wanna I almost wanna ask, um, so how long is it possible? It's like what's the long what's the longest of after of course? Because one of one of the ladies they asked each all of them, um, how long have you been how long have you gone without sex? She was like, uh, 16 years. What? Why? No, though? it was only Why? because she was 16 when she first started having oh, sex. Oh, oh, I see, I see. But yeah, no, so I don't know if you're comfortable answering it, but how long do you think you could go and how long have you gone with no booty? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer from my personal perspective. Come on. Okay, no, I'm not. But I'm going to say that, um, like, once you've had sex and you're sexually active, like, why, why do you do that to yourself? Like, what's the point? People have a lot of bad experiences, and yeah, they kind of no, want to get I, away from it. Yeah. I totally understand that. Like, you need to take a little break, right? But I, from my understanding, sex is not supposed to be, like, a bad thing that's supposed to make you feel negative. You have sex when you feel like you're ready for it and when the time is right, and, you know, you want a little loving. You want a little no, this, spanky this, spank. <laughs> okay. You, you want to share that, but you're not willing to share it. <laughs> Oh God! So, but no, but like this is, and I, I of course I can't tell from the woman's point of view. Mm -hmm. Isn't it cause a whole different kind of connection than it does with most guys? I'm not going to generalize and say all guys, but guys, I think an easier, it can more easily have sex mm -hmm. without it being like, oh, now this is like this person's infused with me. Yeah. But women more, they they have to be more careful in choosing. Not be, and I'm ignoring the society factor, saying, oh, you're a whore, you're a slut. Right. But just. 
it's it caused more of a connection. I'm guessing. I'm just from experiences I've had with women. I think so, it, I it, comparatively speaking, yes, women feel uh, more of a connection or want to feel more of a connection when they're having sex. Of course, there are cases when, you know, women want to hit it and quit it, too. I know Jenk would totally disagree with that. Jenk thinks as soon as a woman wants to sleep with you, that's it. She's, she, she wants to marry you. Like, <laughs> but there are cases where women just want the physical pleasure of it, and they're not looking for that emotional attachment. And look, the whole celibacy thing, I don't understand. When you sit down and you tell yourself, okay, no sex for 20 months, like, why? Why put yourself through that? You know, it's, it's so useless. Like, just do it when you feel like it's right for you, when you're ready, when you meet someone that you feel safe with. No predetermined timeline. Yeah, I hate predetermined timelines. I don't think it makes sense. Like, people, I know, I know people who go through a whole cleansing detox process. And when I say detox, they detox everything out of their lives. Like, all alcohol, all fatty foods, all sex, all this, all that. Like, it's like, okay, I'm going to punish myself for a certain period of time, and then as soon as that timeline's over, I'm going to go crazy. Like, there's no point to that. Yeah, Just the thing is, I understand people stopping sometimes because sometimes their experiences with those things, whatever, maybe drinking, smoking, whatever, mm -hmm. have caused a negative effect on their life. So then they're thinking, let me clear that out. Mm -hmm. But the hard, I think, the hard part is, is saying I'm never, or, or I'm, I'm going to go this long without it. So then if you happen to not do that for two years, mm -hmm. or you happen to do it and slip and do it within the two years, it only makes you feel worse. Right. You know, and then you feeling worse, sometimes if that's, say, your addiction, drinking, whatever, then it makes you want to do it more because you feel bad that you broke your promise to yourself. Right. So just go into it, be healthy. Like, it's like a slow, just go into it slowly, you know? Yeah. And if you meet somebody that, say, you're, hey, you've had bad situations and you meet someone that seems like they're cool, yeah, go ahead and assess them a little closer if you have a history of making bad choices. Assess them a little more, but don't say... I'm not going to do it because then you're going to end up going too far the other way. Just don't think about it too much. I guess that's what the thing is. Sex is natural. It's a normal part of life. When you think about it too much and you give yourself timelines and you give yourself restrictions and you give yourself a hard time when you do something, I mean, it's, it, there's no point to it. You, it. That's not a healthy lifestyle. Just, you know, don't overthink your actions when it comes to sex. Just do it when you feel comfortable with it. That's, I guess that's what the moral of the story is. So don't worry, should, Peppa. It's going to be I was all say, right. So, so are you going to be all on the show? Because I still have I'm all into this show because mm -hmm. um, I still haven't watched it. And I still haven't done any more reality TV. Or, I'm sorry, garbage TV as I, of late. I'm going to be honest with you. Out of all the segments we do, like uh, Dave Kohler's America, uh, What Would Jesus Do, all that stuff. Garbage TV was my favorite. There was only two sorry. of them. I only did two. But they were so good. The first one was really good because that show lasted probably a couple times because everyone was probably complaining about how screwed up that was, the lying show mm -hmm. on the lie detector. And you, I don't even remember the name of it. It was oh, the Fox show. That, yeah, that yeah. was the first one. Then it was the X Effect. Oh, I love it. I love all of it. It was really good. We have to do that again. I want to do one with the Real Housewives of Orange County or Atlanta or any of the housewives because they're so amazingly like... All of them are self-important. All of them are rich when they have no business being rich. It's great. This is the Aspen show that came out. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking about this. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> okay, okay. We got to get to some stories. So let's go to the next one. You know, this story I want to talk about because it's another controversial one, and it's um, involving Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, all right? Um, they actually decided to uh, make their scheduled docking at a private beach in Haiti despite the earthquake that happened, all right? Now, when they did that, they delivered 40 pallets of relief and uh, supplies to help the victims uh, in Haiti. However, many of the people who were vacationing decided, okay, we're going to get off the ship, we're going to uh, party on this private beach, we're going to have a barbecue, we're going to drink, we're going to sunbathe. Meanwhile, um, there are people suffering just miles away from them. So my take on it is, it's it's in bad taste it's super insensitive i mean you can't do that you can't do that in good conscience knowing that there are people dying a few miles away from you people that are starving people that have no food or water come on just think just stay on the ship okay yeah. it's probably for one day stay on the ship enjoy the buffet there it's going to be okay yeah i was wondering if, if this was something that um that you would think the cruise line shouldn't even have gone there or is just to the certain people who decide to get off and act like this is just a, a great vacation spot right now. 
you know? Well, here's the thing. If, if I were uh, the director of this cruise line, I don't know if that's what the head of it is, but if I was the head of this particular cruise, what I would do is, yeah, I would dock there, but I would dock there only to drop off the 40 pallets of relief supplies because that's what good people do, right? But I would tell my passengers, look, I apologize that you guys are not going to be allowed to get off, but free drinks for tonight or free drinks today. Do something that will make the customers happy, but you have to uh, like explain to them and make them understand. The reason why we're not going to allow you guys to get off the ship here is because of the fact that there are people that are dying just a few miles away from the private beach. I wonder if they, I wonder if they didn't anticipate it and they were like, mm -hmm. they were surprised. They were thinking, we'll dock, we'll drop this stuff off. Yeah, we'll allow them to get off if they want to, but maybe they didn't think they'd be partying, you know. But I don't know. If, and maybe they should have a more negative view on humans in general. Yeah. That, they, that they're willing to do that because I don't know. I'm thinking if I was running it, I probably would be surprised that they were willing to do that. Yeah, I, I, I would be surprised yeah. too. I really didn't expect it. I mean, there were people on the ship that would not get off. Okay. In fact, I have a really good quote from uh, one person that was on the cruise. He says, I just can't see myself sunning on the beach, playing in the water, eating barbecue, and enjoying a cocktail while there are tens of thousands of people being piled up on the streets uh, with the survivors stunned and looking around for food and water. I mean, that's a man with a good conscience. He's, he knows that it's not the right thing to do, right? And the ship doesn't even need to necessarily dock there for an extended period of time. Drop off the aid that you have and then, I don't know, go somewhere else. So that, that's what my take is on it. I don't know, maybe other people have uh, different opinions on it, but we'll see. Maybe we're going to get some angry <laughs> Royal Caribbean customers wanting to kill us. Anyway, so let's go to Octomom. She's in a bikini. I, I've been seeing pictures of her working out and stuff, which I think is amazing because I don't even have kids and I hardly have time to work out, but somehow Octomom has like 16 kids and she has time to work out. But anyway, here are recent pictures of her. She's on a beach in a bikini. She's very candid. These are very candid photos. I mean, she had no idea that someone was taking a picture of her. <laughs> oh, my God. You know what? She had eight kids at one time. She looks good. <laughs> she uh, does not look bad. I mean, those titties are definitely, you know. They're what? Plastic. Are they? Yeah, come did, on. Did she get come implants? Come on. They're way too perky and round. They look hard. No, maybe they're just getting held up by her swimsuit. I'm thinking maybe if they come off, then the swimsuit comes off, then they're, they're all over the place. Well, then that is one <laughs> hell of a swimsuit. Well, I don't know. That's not, I'm, I'm not assuming anything. I don't know. I, I don't have breasts, and I don't wear mm -hmm. swimsuits. So, um... I don't know. They look really fake to me. I don't know. I might be wrong, but I doubt it. I mean, Octomom getting plastic surgery, is it really that outrageous? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> and that's, I'm, I'm trying to think of what she may have looked like before. I never really paid attention. But it looks like she has nothing. I don't know. I'm not going to go too far. I think she looks pretty good. I mean, you've got to keep in mind, she had eight kids just, at one time. Yeah, it's just kind of crazy that her hips are that small. And legs, after, like, that's the thing. When you're yeah. pregnant in general, and maybe it's been long enough, she's had time to work it all off. Or whatever she may have done, along with her implants that look like she may have gotten mm -hmm. some lipo and stuff like that. Maybe we have another Heidi on our hands. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, my God. I think I honestly think Heidi looks better than her at this point. Do you Octomom has a really, like, weird face. Her yeah, big is, lips I was and... wondering if, if it wasn't for all of the stuff, the publicity, the kids, the, all this, the, the insanity and her desire to continue with more kids, because I think maybe some of the visual problems with her Maybe just because we know how she is. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe she looks better if she was known for something else. You yeah, know, maybe like, like oh, look at these bikini pictures, she's hot. But then now we're like, because eh, we're imagining 35 kids spilling out of her. Yeah. But I don't know, at the same time. I don't know. Yeah, you know what? Someone wrote a really, really good blog on theyoungturks.com, and it had to do with a woman's attractiveness and how a woman can be super attractive, but if she has a bad personality, she will be ugly to guys. When people know what she's all about, all of a sudden she'll be unattractive. I thought that was really interesting because, yeah, when you think about it, Octomom in and of herself, if you, you know, subtract all of the craziness and all of her media whorishness and all of that stuff, she's not a bad-looking woman, but you look at her and you kind of cringe because you know what she's all about and you know, you know, how psychotic she is. I don't know. I think that might be part of it. Yeah, I think I so, too. I think personality has a lot to do with it, definitely. But then if you actually met her, 
She might be a sweetheart. Sweep you right off your feet. I don't Optimum so. dating service. She wants <laughs> she wants a man for every one of her kids. Oh my god. There's this uh, show on Bravo. It's called um, Meet My Millionaire. No, no, no. Millionaire dating. I don't know. It's some reality show about a million. Like it's a millionaire matchmaker. Actually, I think that's the title of the show. And she hooks up all of her millionaire clients with like, you know, really attractive women. And um, I don't know why I brought that up because I can't. I, f I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, let's just move on to okay, the next. Okay, thank story. you. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on. You're okay. all good, good. All right, let's move on. So uh, we haven't talked about the Golden Globes at all yet, be uh, probably because I find it super boring. But uh, a couple interesting things happened at a couple different award shows over the weekend. For one, at the Critics' Choice Award, uh, Sandra Bullock and Meryl Streep both got tied uh, for the Best Actress Award. All right. So we have video of Sandra Bullock accepting her award, and she does something uh, outrageous. Let's go to the video. Closely. That was the sloppiest looking kiss I've ever seen in my life. Like, yeah, was that the plan? San I don't know. Sandra Bullock doesn't seem like she knows how to kiss very well. She goes in like with her mouth completely open. Look at that. Ooh. Yeah, it was the plan for it. To, maybe it was planned <laughs> for it to be a comedic thing because she said bullshit and is joking. Right. And I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't watch enough of these things. Maybe it's some kind of a. Uh, making fun of a previous award show because I watched none of them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've seen the award show since I was nine years old and I was left alone. Um, my sisters were like babysitting when my parents were gone and uh -huh. I did not want to watch this stupid ass show and I was made to watch it and it would ruin my entire year. Mm -hmm. So I think award shows are probably the dumbest shit I've ever, you know, just in general to watch. I understand maybe people ain't want an award or recognition for what they do, mm -hmm. but I don't get how we can watch it. Anyway, that's a whole side point. I think a lot of people watch it just to see what the celebrities are wearing. I mean, that's a huge part of it. And then people watch it because they're expecting weird stuff like Sandra Bullock kissing Meryl Streep for no apparent reason. Or maybe it was sloppy because Meryl Streep wasn't, she was like, she was surprised and said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the other picture, it's Jesus. Open too. Look, look at that picture. Come on, Sandra. What's wrong with you, girl? She must be joking. I hope so. No, I mean, I don't think that she was actually kissing her and liking it. Like, she wasn't <laughs> thinking, oh, God, Meryl Streep, I've been wanting that. I want to tap that ass. No, like, she wasn't thinking that. But at least, I don't know. I, I would go for a closed mouth kiss if I were uh, attempting to do something outrageous, not for an open mouth. I don't know. Anyway. Mm. But Meryl Streep is awesome, by the way. I saw uh, It's Complicated over the weekend with Alec Baldwin. And it was a good movie. And you know what? Alec Baldwin is a great actor. I really like his acting. He's super talented. He um, was kind of creepy. His, his character was kind of creepy, but I think he played it really well. And I also saw an old school movie over the weekend. Uh, it was actually a 2001 movie, The Score, with uh, Robert De Niro. And you know what that movie reminded me of? It reminded me of the fact that when I first started working here, I had no idea who Robert De Niro was. <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember and now, now I'm like a movie fiend. And you've seen all of his movies now. I've seen a lot of his movies. All on DVD on your movie nights. Yeah, I actually signed up for Netflix over the weekend, and I was uh, watching random movies. Blockbuster.com, go that way. Really? Is um, it cheaper? Not, I don't know. Oh, okay. it's different. There's a bunch of different ideas, so it doesn't matter. Um, no, I, I, I actually had forgotten about that. You should never bring that up again. What? That you didn't know who Robert De Niro was before you got here. Yeah, no, no, no. I think it's a good thing that I'm bringing it up. You know why? Because mm -hmm. it's shown how I've grown. And so look, was that you your... have to understand, the reason why I didn't know much about movies and actors is because I was raised by two immigrant parents who, had, who were scared of the world. Like, they never went to the movies. They never bought movies. The movie world was not important to them. What was important to them was that I sat in my room and I learned spelling and grammar. And I didn't know English when I went into school. So it was like, you got to learn English, you got to do good in school, screw everything else. Damn. Pop culture is not important. How do you think your parents feel under that bus right now? 
<laughs> I mean, I think my parents are proud of that. I grew up with two immigrant parents who said, you don't have any fun. You sit your ass in your room. You don't do shit, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, my parents, I think I had the, I have the best parents in the world, though. Like, they didn't, it's not necessarily that they told me not to watch movies. They just, it was never around me. No one in my family watched movies, so I didn't grow up around it. So, yeah, I didn't know who Robert De Niro was. But to me, Robert De Niro was the most unimportant person in the world, right? So was it three years ago? I mean, how long have you been here? Three years ago. So three years ago, uh, no, no Robert De Niro this year. No football, so we'll see if you stand up to that one. That'll change. I'm serious. Look. I don't believe you. I, I, I think no. you're serious, but I don't think it's going to happen. That's all. I think it's going to happen. I'll help you out if you want. You know why it's going to happen? Because I get super jealous when you guys get to talk about it. No, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> I get jealous. I want to talk about it, too. Like, I want to be with the in crowd. I want to be like, oh, yeah, man, the Packers. Woo! Yeah, and the thing is, you can know that part, but it's just a matter of, I guess, to the level of you want to know the gameplay. The but strategy. I do want to know the gameplay. Yeah. I don't I don't want to be one of these superficial football fan, fans that have no idea what's going on. I want to know what's going on. I want to know why some of the players are fat and some of them are nice and skinny. Like I want to know like what's going on. Okay. All right. All right. And I'm going to learn. You guys Pro will see. Progress will be reported on the show. <laughs> All right. So, um, I I'm going to do a couple really really quick stories and then we're going to call it a night. So, um, Fergie and her husband, Josh, were at the Golden Globes. We have a photo of it. I only have one thing to say about the photo. Let's go to it. Who looks more orange, Fergie or Josh? Uh, you know what? They're, they're matching pretty well, actually. They're both so orange. I wouldn't have thought that. It's one of those things that I think a lot more, well, unless you're, like, straight up orange. Mm -hmm. But, um... It's one of those things I don't notice for some reason when people are in up orange. And is that is that because of a spray tan or is that because of an actual tan? I don't know. I have a feeling that, that the look, all fake tans look fake, right? But orange, the or more orangey ones tend to be the spray tans. Spray tans are very, very questionable. And how is it that they still happen? Why why isn't the orange spray tan advanced to a brown tan? Well, yeah. Why aren't they out of business yet? If if every time anybody has one. Is pointing out, hey, you look like Oompa Loompa. I don't know, man. I think that they're having a very difficult time improving their technology. I mean, it, it, they're not getting the chemicals quite right. I don't know. I'm, I'm totally against spray tans. I'll give you an example of why. When we went rafting at Kern, m I put, like, spray tan on my legs, and, th and then we wore body suits, right, because the river's cold, and in case we fell out, we wanted to be warm, whatever. Um, when I took my bodysuit out, I had the most disgusting streaks on my legs. I had striped, like white and orange striped legs. And I'm like, oh, never again. So, well, so what was I'm the point so of it, though? What, what, it's to, uh, was that like protection? Was, I know there's, what was it called? The no. block? Was it sunblock? No, it wasn't sunblock. It, look, I knew that we were going to go rafting. I knew that my legs were going to be exposed. There was no way in hell I was going to have white pasty legs. So I'm like, I got to do something. I'm against tanning salons, right? I got to do something. So I went and I bought this Jergens brand something or other. It was a disaster. Don't do it. It's it's bad. It's bad. Okay, next picture. It's of Rihanna and her boyfriend, her new boyfriend, LA Dodgers player Matt Kemp. Oh, yeah, we were right. talking about this. Yeah, they were at the Lakers versus Clippers game. Let's go to the picture real quick. All <laughs> right. The only thing I have to say about it is Hey Sus, what do you think? Because it's a Dodger, you know? R Rihanna is Jesus' uh, right. <laughs> What do I think? What do you like? think of this couple? What do you think? I mean, yeah. It's great. I mean, good for him. It's awesome. Yay. Well, I don't know. I don't see. I thought we were going to talk about this hair that looks like it's from 1989. She, look, that's what I'm saying about Rihanna. I personally think Rihanna is much better when her hair is long. She always does these crazy, like, mohawks right there. What is that? Like a poodle cut? Like, girl, just, I know you're trying to be edgy, but that doesn't look edgy. That looks stupid. Like, just grow your hair out, please. She's a, um. Or if you want to keep your hair short, fine, keep it short. But that's just unnecessary, and it's unattractive. She looks really old. That, I don't know, I'm sorry. That particular yeah. hairstyle, it reminds me of, like, an aunt that I have that, you know, and when I was, like, 10, she was 45. So, I don't know, it, it, it totally ages her. She's still only, like, 22 years, 23 years old, right? She's younger than me. I think she's, is she barely 21? I think she's Maybe. 21. Yeah, she's, I know she's younger than me, so. I mean, seriously, if you didn't know who that was, how old would you think she is? I, I would 30, think she's in her. Minimum, she's a cougar. 
<laughs> no, not 35. I would, I would guess, now, now I'm using 35 as like the cougar age. Anyway, but no, I would say that she looks at least 28, 28 to 30 in those pictures. And it's totally because of the hair. I don't know why she's doing that with her hair. And possibly because of what she's wearing. So. All of it, man. Scrap yeah. it. Take Scrap it all. It. Take it all off, Rihanna. Take, well, take take it all off. Matt over there seems to like it. Look at him. He's like, mm, that looks. Oh, good. don't get me wrong. Because of you know, yeah, I'd, I'd go there with her. Fuck it. Let's make it happen. Right. But you know, I'd be happy to in there too. <laughs> but we're gonna drop that. Moving on. All right, guys. Um. All right, let's do one more story. Yeah, yeah, one more. And then we're going to call it a night. So uh, there's a company. It's known as Waterproof Garment Co. or company. And um, they had this whole Times Square New York advertisement featuring Barack Obama. Barack Obama was actually wearing one of their coats on his trip to visit the Great Wall in China. Anyway, um, the White House had a problem with that. And they said, no, you are not allowed to use an image of the president for commercial purposes. You must take that down. Um, Waterproof Garment Company says that they did everything legally. They did not break any laws. So there was really no need for them to take the um, image down. However, they did agree to take it down for the White House. And um, they're not going to do it immediately. They're going to wait until they create a new advertisement. And then they'll put the new ad up and take the old one down. But I think it's so dumb. I mean, the White House causing all this controversy over the uh, the ad is bringing more attention to it. So, well, then that, that's good for the company because mm -hmm. I mean, apparently he likes their coats, right? <laughs> and you can say if the president likes it, you should like it too. Fine, but I I do understand the White House saying that you don't want the, the president to be a commercial president. Yeah. Uh, because then he's gonna start getting seen as you know he's just he's another he's another model for our coats. Yeah, I think if I worked for that company, I'd say. He's wearing our fucking coat. Let's do it. He wears he wears our coats. And how easy is this tagline? Mm -hmm. You know, if it's good enough for the president, I mean, don't you want to be like Obama? There's so many things you can just get people that like to follow. To all of a sudden you have this explosion. But I think the reason that they went ahead and take, took it down is yeah, they're getting all this attention. Mm -hmm. People did see it. Now more people that I would have never even heard or seen about this I'm right. not in New York um, than they are now. So yeah, go ahead and take it down. You you've, you're, you're gonna get the publicity more than the publicity that you were already gonna get. You got it. Make the White House happy. Take it down. You still get whatever boost you're going to get. That's true. I think it's cool. You take it down and make them happy, and then you're not a bad guy anymore. Because then if they didn't, I'd be like, dude, just take it down. And I'd be more against them. I'd be mm -hmm. less willing to want anything to do with this company if I was going to spend too much money on a coat, which yeah. I'm sure is overpriced. And I'm sure that they knew that they were going to face um, a bunch of haters if they didn't agree to take the poster down or the advertisement down. So, yeah, I think they played it right. They did the right thing. And I, how scary would it be to be contacted by White House lawyers? I was thinking about that, too. Like, you know, White House lawyer calls us and says, hey, you guys royally pissed off the Australians. You're in big trouble unless you retract all your statements. Would you do it? Would I do what? Retract them? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Yeah, neither would I. <laughs> Hell no. What I would do is, I, I, I'm, I, the reason I was thinking for a while is I was like, what's the best way we can use this? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing. White House lawyers to contact you, they know... That people are like, hey, guess what? White House lawyers contacted me. Right. That's exactly what this company did. Come on, dude. It's, it, you got to use it. And then, yeah, and then eventually be like, you know, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, like, I'd like to issue, no. <laughs> All right, What God. are you going to do? Uh, I know. Yeah, that's true. But White House lawyers sound kind of scary and intimidating. I'd be afraid. But who knows? Jared Jackson's stronger than me. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us on the Young Turks today. As I said, Jenk will be back tomorrow. So uh, expect our normal schedule, normal guests, and have a good night, Young Turks. <laughs>